Greetings, this is Greg. During World War II, the U.S. fielded the Allison V-1710, a supercharged liquid-cooled V-12 engine, and for the most part it powered the B-team fighters, like Bell's P-39 Aero Cobra and the Curtis P-40 Warhawk. While both of these were good airplanes, they were unable to escort high-altitude bombers and were overshadowed and outperformed by P-47 Thunderbolts and the Merlin-powered P-51 Mustang variants. The only true high-altitude capable fighter the U.S. flew in combat during the war with an Allison V-12 was the P-38 Lightning, which was quite different from the other V-12-powered fighters because of its turbo supercharging system, which is a story covered on this channel in other videos. Meanwhile, the British were powering their fighters very often with the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, a 1650 cubic inch supercharged liquid-cooled V-12, much like the Allison. The Merlin didn't only power fighters, the Mosquito and the Lancaster were Merlin powered as well. The North American P-51 Mustang was initially powered by the Allison, but famously switched over to the Merlin, and with that switch came a huge increase in performance, specifically high altitude performance. This leads to a question, it's a question I get all the time, which is why was the Merlin better? First of all, that question has a conclusion in it, which sort of sets up a false premise, making a simple answer impossible. I understand the reason for this question when you consider the fact that North Americans switched the P-51 Mustang over to the Merlin, and the fact that Merlins were built in the United States under license by Packard, it certainly looks like the Merlin must have been the better of the two. But that's not exactly the case. If comparing single-stage, single-speed supercharged Merlins to Allison's, they're pretty close to equal in any metrics you can compare. In fact, if anything, the Allison comes out slightly ahead in most categories. The difference, and the comparison that I think matters here, is the supercharging systems, not the engines themselves. The Merlin pulled ahead of the Allison because of its dual-stage supercharging system, which came along in 1942, and this did two things for the Merlin. It gave it more power, and more importantly, it allowed it to make a large percentage of its maximum power through a very wide range of altitudes. The Merlin's dual-stage supercharging system was brilliant. It used two superchargers on the same shaft to save space and incorporated an inner cooler to cool the air down between the stages and an after cooler to cool down the charged air before it went into the engine cylinders, thus allowing for more power via more boost and greater charge air density. So it's not exactly that the Merlin was a better engine, but its dual-stage supercharging system was far better than any single-stage system typically used on the Allison. Quite a few viewers here understand that, which is why I get this second question from these more experienced viewers all the time. The second question being, why didn't Allison put a dual-stage mechanically driven supercharging system on their V1710? Well, they did, but it was late to the party. We have to back up for a moment. In the 1930s, the U.S. Army Air Corps was just hell-bent on using turbochargers, correctly called turbo superchargers, as an auxiliary supercharging stage to feed the engine's mechanically driven main stage supercharger. There were some good reasons for doing that, but turbo systems at the time took up a lot of space. They were big. For that reason, all World War II turbocharged airplanes that were successful in combat were big airplanes. Think P-38 Lightning. P-47 Thunderbolt, and most of the four-engine heavy bombers fielded by the U.S. Army Air Force. Meanwhile, the U.S. Navy sort of steered away from turbocharging and put their eggs into the dual-staged, mechanically-driven supercharging basket. However, the U.S. Navy also steered away from liquid-cooled engines in combat aircraft. Thus, within the U.S. military, there was just no place for an Allison with a dual-stage mechanically driven supercharger. The U.S. Army Air Force didn't want one. They wanted a turbo auxiliary stage like what was used on the Allison and the P-38 Lightning. And the U.S. Navy didn't want that V-1710 in a combat aircraft at all. They didn't want any liquid-cooled engines used in that way. As no branch of the military was going to buy an Allison with a two-stage mechanically driven supercharger, there just wasn't much incentive to build one. However, as time went on, the realities of war forced two things to become very apparent in regards to supercharging. First of all, dual-stage mechanically driven supercharging systems were very effective, as proven by the U.S. Navy's air-cooled radial engine-powered fighters, 
and of course by the Rolls-Royce Merlin powering Spitfires and more. These systems were not quite as efficient on paper as a turbocharger, but in reality, due to the packaging and other advantages of mechanically driven systems, they were preferable in many cases. The other reality that became very apparent was the superiority of Germany's supercharger drive system as used on the Daimler-Benz inverted V12s. I have an entire video about this, so I don't need to cover it here, but the short version is that in planes like the BF109, the supercharger is normally driven by a system that can speed up or slow down the supercharger to maintain the desired level of boost or manifold pressure throughout a wide altitude range and without throttling the supercharger. This results in more overall power from the engine than the single or two speed supercharger drives commonly used by the Allies. Of course, the Germans had a whole set of problems holding their engines back, but their supercharger drive system was superior. So one of the questions I often get is, if the German hydraulic drive was so good, why didn't the U.S., with all its industrial might, simply copy it? The answer is, they did. Allison built a dual-stage V1710, and that AUX stage was driven by a hydraulic coupler in much the same way Daimler-Benz drove the supercharger in a 109. The only plane to see combat with this system in World War II was the P-63 King Cobra, so that's the version I'll talk about. The dual-stage Allison put out a lot of power, and it did have that power through a wider altitude range than a single-stage, single-speed setup, but it was not as fully developed as a late-war dual-stage Merlin as used in a P-51. For example, the Allison didn't have an intercooler or an aftercooler like the Merlin. That's a big drawback. As the plane climbs, the air has to be compressed more and more by the supercharger to maintain manifold pressure, which means that the air heats up. That decreases air density, and the supercharger drive power goes up as well. What Allison did was put water methanol injection on it, which helped cool the supercharged air and allowed for more manifold pressure than would otherwise be allowable. Now let's take a look at the power chart for a dual stage setup in a P63 King Cobra versus the same basic engine in a P39Q. Now this isn't exactly apples to apples as the P39 is on 100 octane fuel, P63 is on 130, but that's the way the planes were set up to run. As you can see, the P63 King Cobra has a lot more power. It's running 76 inches of manifold pressure, giving it 1,840 horsepower at sea level. The P39 Era Cobra has only 1,350 horsepower at sea level with its 57 inches of manifold pressure. The P39's power suffers a bit below 9,000 feet due to supercharger throttling, a drawback of that single speed supercharger drive. You can't open the throttle fully below 9,000 feet in this airplane or you exceed the manifold pressure limit. Now above 9,000 feet, the P39's power falls off a bit faster than the King Cobra's. And at 20,000 feet, it's down to 860 horsepower versus 1325 for the King Cobra with the dual stage engine. While this looks pretty good for the dual stage Allison, it's important to note that it's still losing power with altitude as it climbs above sea level. The power doesn't fall too quickly, but it does fall. For further comparison, let's add in a dual stage, dual speed supercharged engine, a V1650 3, which was a Packard built Merlin engine installed in the P51 Mustang running on 130 octane fuel at 67 inches of manifold pressure. I had to expand the chart a bit to fit this. I wasn't thinking of this engine when I started the video. Both the Allison and Merlin here are on the same 130 octane fuel, but the Allison with its water methanol injection system can run 75 inches of manifold pressure. The Merlin with its intercooler and aftercooler runs a bit less, 67 inches. By the way, the Allisons also have a higher static compression ratio. 6.65 to 1 versus only 6 to 1 for the Merlin. The point of all this is that the Allison's water methanol system is doing some heavy lifting, allowing 76 inches of manifold pressure with no charge cooling and more compression than the Merlin. That really drives home the point of just how effective water methanol injection is at warding off knock and allowing high manifold pressure values. Now, as you can see, the Allison is making more power down at sea level, over 300 horsepower more. However, power starts to drop off as soon as it climbs. Not much at first. It's only dropping from 1,840 to about 1,800 horsepower in the first 5,000 feet, but it loses more and more as it climbs. I don't have a complete manifold pressure chart 
for the P63 King Cobra, but we know it had 76 inches at war emergency power at sea level, probably up to at least 10,000 feet. I know manifold pressure starts to drop off pretty early as compared with the Merlin we're talking about here. The Merlin Dash 3 can maintain its 67 inches up to 29,000 feet, where it's still managing about 1,410 horsepower. That ability to run all that manifold pressure up at altitudes that high is why it makes a lot more power than a dual stage Allison way up there. Notice the Merlin Dash 3 is still making less power up at 29,000 than it is at its best altitude of 16,400 feet. It's using a lot of power to drive that two-stage supercharger fast enough to make that manifold pressure. It does have great charge cooling, but that's still subject to the thermodynamic realities involved, so all that is costing it a bit in power up there. This is not intended to be a comparison between the Allison and the Merlin. I'm trying to show the differences between the supercharging systems. In fact, it's interesting to look at this version of the Merlin as compared with the Allison and the P39 Era Cobra. The Merlin's dual staging gives it more power, and the dual speed is what's allowing it to make more power at really high altitudes. Of course, the drawback of the dual speed design is that there is going to be an altitude range, often called the supercharger gap, in which the low speed can't provide enough manifold pressure for optimal power, and the high speed causes throttling losses to decrease power. That gap is very apparent on this chart. The variable speed drives eliminate that almost entirely. Now look at the dual stage Allison. It's making more power than the Merlin, but less up at high altitudes. The dual stage Allison was never really optimized or maximized in the P63. Its lack of charge cooling, meaning no intercooler and no aftercooler, really hurt it up at higher altitudes. The AUX supercharger also doesn't have the speed range to give a lot of manifold pressure up at 25,000 feet. Yes, it's a hydraulic drive, but remember there is still a gear drive involved and those gear ratios decide the supercharger impeller's maximum speed. They kept that speed low because without more charge cooling or some charge cooling, there was no way to safely use more manifold pressure up at high altitudes. None of this was lost on Bell Aircraft, Allison, or NACA. They knew they could make this system a lot better. In fact, NACA did their usual testing and found that with a bigger carb, a different drive ratio for the hydraulic coupling, and charge cooling, they could run this engine with 1,840 horsepower all the way up to 17,000 feet, with a smooth, gradual drop-off to 1,200 horsepower at 29,000 feet. We never saw that in the P-63 King Cobra for reasons I'll get into in my upcoming video on the plane. That said, the P-63C performed very well with the version of the two-stage Allison it did have. There just wasn't much need or motivation to make it any better. That's another story. Dual-stage supercharging absolutely took over. Nearly every post-war high-performance fighter used this technology, meaning one supercharger blowing into another. It was also used on some Italian and British race cars. I have a video about that as well. As for that hydraulic drive coupling, like the Germans were using, it was used with great success post-war on the Corsair Dash 5. Republic used it on their XP-72. Both are planes covered on this channel in other videos. North American's P-82 twin Mustang used not only a dual stage with a hydraulically driven aux stage, it did this with the Allison engine. North American also experimented with this in the XP-51J lightweight Mustang. It was an experimental aircraft, only one was built. It featured an Allison V-1710, which was essentially an upgraded P-63 King Cobra engine. I'm pretty sure it incorporated the upgrades suggested by NACA. For example, NACA suggested upping the drive ratio for the aux stage from the 6.85 to 1 gear set in the King Cobra to 8.08 to 1. The XP-51J used an 8.1 to 1 ratio. I'm certain that's the same gear set, the slight difference being due to rounding. It also used an aftercooler, exactly like the proposed NACA setup. Again, only one was built. Not much is known about it. However, I understand Mr. Marshall will be coming out with a book about the lightweight P-51s, this one and others, so we should all have a chance to learn more about them. Please be on the lookout for my P-63 King Cobra video in early to mid-October. In that video, I'll talk about how all this worked in an actual airplane that saw combat during World War II. Also, please consider joining my Patreon. Memberships there start at only $1.
and you get access to a lot of aircraft manuals, wartime technical documents, various books, including one I wrote about supercharging, and much more. That's all for now. Goodbye, and have a great day.